Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners, and a happy Independence Day to all of you. Thank you so much for listening. We have just a wonderful conversation to present to you this week with Professor Joseph Ellis and Clay Jenkinson talking about Independence Day. And you'll note I say Independence Day, not the 4th. Or the 2nd or May 15th or whatever it turns out that it should be, you know. Uh, Joseph Ellis is an Adamsite. We know that. We love that about him. That he was he was rabbit punching Jefferson all day today, trying to say, oh, you know, uh, the Fourth of July was really just a, a a news release, and that the real day was the second. And you know, Jefferson ran away with the revolution, and it wasn't even an original document, and it was all based on John Locke or George Mason's Virginia Declaration of Rights, and yada 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 yada. The fact is. And then, but then he admitted, David, he admitted that the magic sentence of American history is that one, the 35 words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Even a profound Adamsite has to acknowledge that that's the sentence. I think you're being a little defensive for our man Jefferson. I thought uh, Joe Ellis was eloquent in his praise of Jefferson, that um, almost to the point of being uh, recognizing him as an indispensable man, which of course he is in, in the American Revolution. But it's a great conversation, a lot about the dates, but around all of that, what happened, why it happened. Um, I, I thought it was real interesting, the uh, section of the conversation about just how much jeopardy the signers were in um, about how long it actually took them all to sign it. I think he, you or he said it was October before the final signature was put on. And and then also some discussion about uh, you asking what everybody's going to do on the 4th and how we're going to uh, recognize it. But it was it was pretty musical, almost religious towards the end of this discussion. I love the 4th of July. Um, I love to be out in somewhere where it's 85 degrees and 7% humidity, maybe uh, on the Little Missouri River or on the Missouri River on a sandbar, a barbecue of some sort and some modest fireworks. All those things I find uh, absolutely wonderful. It's really the only day in the calendar year that I do those things. And uh, you just feel like that may not be the intention of the 4th of July. That may not be what Jefferson would most want us to do on the 4th of July. But somehow that is the 4th of July. And I think that uh, this year particularly, and I made the case for this during the, the broadcast, that we've been cooped up for 15 months, frightened, many lives shattered, people worried about putting food on the table, p staying in their houses, making their car payments getting their children educated, juggling work and homeschooling, et cetera. And I think now that the pandemic is, is, is largely in the rear view mirror, not entirely, that this year is going to be, we're, we're going to see a lot of exuberance by people who feel that this is a national day of liberation this year. Truly an independence day. So let's, uh, I'm going to keep the, uh, the pitch to a minimum and just say, we really appreciate your support of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. You can go to jeffersonhour.com, click on Donate, and there's all sorts of options. Neither Clay or I take anything personally from this. It all goes into the show, and we need your support, and we appreciate it. And with that, do you quickly have anything you want to alert people about? Uh, Virgil's Aeneid in August. Go to the Jefferson Hour site for other cultural tours, Steinbeck's California in the spring, Cuba, and also next fall, uh, a second trip to Jefferson's France. All those things are there. Uh, and my book, The Language of Cottonwoods, is now out. So this is a great time for the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We so deeply appreciate you. And, and, and we've had two guests in the last couple of weeks, one our friend Lindsay Chervinsky and the other Joseph Ellis. And, and David, here's what they both said. They like coming on the Jefferson Hour because they like the quality of our listeners. They, they, they believe that we have a dedicated, serious, engaged, and loyal, and that they, that they, they get it, that there's some, that, we've, that we've luckily created a community that really is serious about this country. 
And they both like to come on because it gives them a chance to be with people who are genuinely interested in the future of the American Republic. I thought I, I was really pleased that both of them volunteered that. So join me, Clay, in wishing everyone a happy, healthy, safe, and meaningful celebration of Independence Day this year. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. And this week, in recognition of Mr. Jefferson's approval of this holiday that he chose to celebrate, we are joined on the phone by Mr. Clay Jenkinson and by the noted historian and author, Professor Joseph Ellis. I'm your host, David Swenson, and gentlemen, I bid you both a happy 4th of July this week. And because we're talking about Independence Day, I'm hoping we can begin the conversation with that story that almost seems too unusual to be true, and that would be the death on the 4th of July of both President Jefferson and President Adams. And I, I'm hoping you can both weigh in on that. Well, here's what we know, that um, these two old patriarchs um, had quarreled um, and had let the friendship uh, sputter out uh, around 1800. And in 1812, they were sort of brought back into almost a shotgun correspondence by their mutual friend, Dr. Benjamin Rush. And at first they were very tentative and, 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 uh, and uh, cautious. Uh, but soon, the, as Jefferson said, the sluice gates of their ancient affection opened and they exchanged this marvelous series of letters over the last 14 years of their life. Adams wrote about four to one um, in, in the numbers of letters. Jefferson was a little bit more formal, a little bit less candid and forthcoming. But then the friendship was fully restored. I think that they really did love each other deeply. Uh, by the end, and then by the strangest of historical coincidences, they both died within hours of each other uh, and several hundred miles apart on the 4th of July, 1826. And there is a whole world of mythology that has sort of sprung up around that. But, but Joe, the fact is that Jefferson died around noon uh, on the 4th of July, and John Adams died, I think, roughly around 5 p.m. That's true. Jefferson lapsed into unconsciousness the evening before, and his last recorded words were, is it the fourth? And it's almost like he and now both of them are arranging to die on schedule. And Adams' last words were, Thomas Jefferson survives, or Thomas Jefferson still lives. Two versions record mentioned differently by different people in the room, his, his grandchildren. But of course, Jefferson didn't live. He died only a few hours earlier that same day. And it was reported in the press extensively as indication of uh, something truly, well, I mean, you couldn't make it up if you were writing a novel. It would be regarded as unbelievable. Uh, Southern writers tended to focus on Jefferson's death and, in their cases, question whether Adams really died that day or not. New England writers gave Adams a bit more preference, but didn't attempt in any way to denigrate Jefferson. But I'd like to make a case that I want Clay's opinion as about this, that celebrating the 4th of July as the day had always been wrong. It wasn't the right day to celebrate. And both of them knew that, Adams even more so. And that by dying on that day, they decided to make it right. And then in American history, afterwards, things happened. Well, but before then, on the 4th of July, 1803, we got word of the Louisiana Purchase. On the 4th of July, 1846, I think, Thoreau goes out to Walden. On the 4th of July, 1863, Lee retreats from Gettysburg. The 4th keeps turning up a lot, but I guess I want to make the case that it never was the right date to celebrate American independence. Okay, this is going to be good. What do you, what do you have to say to that, Clay? A couple of things. First of all, uh, the 4th of July was also the date that they wanted to test the atomic weapon at uh, the mm. Trinity. Almagordo, thank goodness that didn't happen. It wasn't until July 16th. The 4th of July is also the day that James Monroe died. Well, Madison didn't die on the 4th, but Monroe, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson all died 
on the fourth. Yeah, you know, March. Madison died like on you know June twenty eighth or something like that. It's like all these guys are aiming for that date. I mean, it's like they can will their own deaths. And that's uh, why I prove that you're wrong, Joe, because Jefferson, you know, Adams later said Jefferson ran away with the revolution and that it was kind of a a, a stage show almost. Mm-hmm. That's true. The, the Declaration of Independence is not the most important of the dates. The most important date probably is the resolution uh, introduced to declare independency or the acceptance, the voting on the resolution on July 2nd. The 4th of July is the day that Congress unanimously approved the Declaration of Independence, and that wasn't very well known for a long time. But as yeah, it, The only reason we, the, it, the 4th is meant is the date is because it was, the, it's the date that the printer put on top of the uh, printed document uh, uh, the fourth. And um, there's a very famous portrait called the Declaration of Independence. The original hangs in the rotunda by John Trumbull. It shows Jefferson alongside Adams and um, Benjamin Franklin and two other members, uh, two other delegates approaching the desk of John Hancock, and I would venture to guess that almost every tourist thinks that's a picture of the signing ceremony of the Declaration, and it's July 4th. It's not. It's a picture of the moment when the committee that drafted the Declaration presents the draft to the full Congress on June 28th, Jefferson handing the document to Hancock. Um, in truth, even though the play 1776 makes the July 4th the big day of the signing, and it's, it's you know, it's a um, poetic license, I guess, nobody signed it on the 4th. Nobody. Most of them signed it on August 2nd. And people were coming and going in Philadelphia signing all the way up until October. It's funny it's how some of them who are latecomers to their cause, like Robert Morris, puts his name at the beginning of the list because he can squeeze it in because he's one of the last people to sign. But there is no single signing ceremony. Listen to this sour grapes. All right, Joe, where was that Trumbull painting painted? Where was it painted? God, was it painted in London? I Paris. don't know. Paris. Paris? This is how Jefferson manipulated history. So he uh, took people in in his um, his salon in Paris, and he became a kind of a patron. And he said, "It's important that we get this right. I want to help uh, you to make this historical painting has epic qualities." And so he helped to shape the legend of the Fourth of July by getting the illusion. And that painting is, is wholly inaccurate in terms of what actually happened, but it shows Jefferson as the master mm-hmm. of all of this. And and so Adams was right that Jefferson was, uh, in a sense, appropriating the Independence Day for his own purposes because he was the primary author of the Declaration of Independence and that there are more important days in the history of America's independence movement. But mm-hmm. as you will readily acknowledge, uh, as usual, Jefferson won. Uh, yeah, he did. He won the public relations campaign. And uh, and, and in some ways, the judgment of history, uh, I think that it's interesting that when Jefferson decided what to put on his tombstone, he didn't put the presidency. He didn't put first secretary of state. He didn't put the Louisiana Purchase. The first thing he put was author of the Declaration of Independence. Second thing was author of the Virginia Law for Separation of Church and State or Freedom of Religion. And the third was founding in the University of Virginia. He knew what his ticket to immortality was. It, and, um, you know, we're essentially eroding the significance of that document. And I'll talk in a minute why Adams believes it's less significant. What no one at the time commented on, but became the central reason for the Declaration's significance. And the only part of it that say ben, that Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King will cite is the second paragraph that nobody makes any changes in. They 
make 86 changes in Jefferson's draft. They change a little over 20 percent, delete or revise 20 percent of his text. But they don't touch the magic words, the ones that begin, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, Um, that those are the magic words of American history. And Jefferson did write them. And let me ask you this, my friend, and this is a serious question. Could any other American have written words that magical for that occasion? The only person who I think you could make a case for is Franklin, but I don't think so. He is, he was regarded as the prose stylist uh, of his era in the United States, but he didn't have a, he had a, he had a different style. It wasn't as um, lyrical as Jefferson's. Uh, and um, it, 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 it had a flair for paradox and for um, sarcasm. But the answer to your question, short answer is no. Jefferson's the only person that could have written it. So, so in a certain sense, that's a tremendous vindication of Thomas Jefferson that he was the one as, as Lincoln put it, who had the forecast on this occasion to write essentially immortal and eternal words about human aspiration. And he had an idealism and a firmness and a clarity of prose and a, a really a capacity to make prose poetry and poetry prose that was unique. And others could have done something remarkable. No question about that. Adams, Franklin, Washington, Thomas Paine, any number of people, but Jefferson is the magic man. And because of that, there's some kind of appropriateness that he ran away with the whole thing, right? True enough. And in calling attention to Lincoln's assessment, Lincoln's the other poet in the group. I mean, Lincoln's words in his um, first inaugural and second inaugural and Gettysburg Address are the matching. And they go back in each case to Jefferson's words. uh, and the, one of the phrases he uses that always made me smile is that, that Jefferson inserted into a merely revolutionary document <laughs> an eternal truth. I love that. A merely revolutionary document. Isn't that great? That is great. A merely revolutionary document. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, our annual Independence Day show. This year with Professor Joseph Ellis and the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. And we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We're so pleased this week to be joined by the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Clay Jenkinson, and the historian and author, Professor Joseph Ellis. And gentlemen, before you're off and running, I need to settle this in my own mind and for the sake of our listeners. What about the the date, the 4th of July? Is it incorrect or not? What do you say, Clay? Well, let me quote from an eminent American in a letter to a woman named Abigail Adams. (laughs) The second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable epoch in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other, from this time forward, forevermore. Beautiful, beautiful statement. And he nailed it. That is how we celebrate the 4th of July. He got every element. He got everything right, even the fireworks, but he got the date wrong. Poor Mr. Adams, you know. It, it, it now, could... listen, I mean, I listen, I'm the Adams guy in this dialogue, <laughs> right? And Clay has just stolen my best stuff. I'm um, sorry. Um, because the real answer is the proper date to celebrate independence is July 2nd. That's the date they voted on the resolution from Virginia, from uh, Richard Henry Lee, that these colonies are and have every right to be independent states. That was the resolution they voted on. And after that passed, they went into Committee of the Whole to go to edit Jefferson's draft. And when that happened, Jefferson was sitting next to Franklin. 
And Franklin had refused, had initially been offered the opportunity to draft this document and had said, I refuse to write any document that will be edited by a committee. And as the whole Congress is is becoming is a committee to edit. But imagine, you know, if you could ever imagine the Congress of the United States ever agreeing on anything. But they improve the text. Most historians they eliminate a lot of stuff in the Jefferson draft, and Jefferson is wincing at each change. And Franklin leans over and says to him, "And remind me, what does he say, Clay?" Well, he tells this ridiculous story about a man who had a sign about hats. Guy asked his friends, "How I, I, I'm a hatter. I sell hats. I want a sign. Here's my draft." And he presents it to him, and it's like John Thompson Hatter sells hats mm-hmm. uh, for ready money. And, and then one of his friends says, "Well, if you're a hatter, we know you sell hats." And then another person says, "For ready money, what do they think you give them away?" And they go on and on and on until finally there's just a picture of a hat. And the idea was to 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 cheer Jefferson up, at least to distract him from his agony as he winced from moment to moment. And it's a really, from our point of view, it's a tedious story, but it's typical Franklin, a parable that gets the point across, but disarms the tension in the room. Um, and Jefferson dutifully reports it. So that was, that was Franklin's attempt to keep Jefferson from bolting from the room or <laughs> a nervous breakdown there. And Jefferson personally made like multiple copies of his original draft and sent it around to all his friends in Virginia and said, this is the real thing. This is what they, what's the word? He says, mangled the text. Mangled the text. Mangled the text, yeah. And now, Clay, listen to this. One of the paragraphs that they completely delete is a paragraph that if you reread it now, it's like, it's one of the most confusing syntactically and grammatically confusing pieces of prose that Jefferson ever wrote. And I have thought about this over the years, and it seems to me the reason it's so difficult to understand grammatically is that Jefferson is in that paragraph attempting to do something radical. The impossible. He is saying that The slave trade, he emphasizes the slave trade, has been imposed upon us by George III. But he also implies that slavery itself is something that we have had imposed upon us by the British royalty. And it is possible to read this, and I do read this, to mean that Jefferson is attempting to put slavery on the same agenda as independence. That is, we are blaming George III for everything else. We might as well blame him for this too and put on the record in the founding document that the new American Republic begins with the assumption that slavery must eventually be ended. What do you think of that interpretation? I couldn't agree more. Jefferson's prose breaks down a little because it's a it's a convoluted and and disingenuous argument. He knows that the argument is not true, but he's using this occasion to say this: uh, we're declaring independence. And by the way, if people would have just left us alone, we would have already solved this problem of slavery. So don't blame us. We're going to say that was part of the tyranny package that was imposed upon us by George the Third and Parliament. And that's one thing that it says. But the other thing that it says, Joe, is, and and we're not going to, it would be, a, I think Jefferson is saying is it would, it would be a mistake for us to declare our national birth certificate as a nation of liberty if we didn't address this issue and make it clear that we were uncomfortable and we intended to solve this issue. Don't you think? I agree. And just think if uh, I'm working on some a project that, about the founders and slavery new- now, and that there's so many moments, and this is one big one, when if things had gone differently, um, the future of 19th century American history and the Civil War would have, would have been different. Um, Franklin wants to do something analogous to this in the Constitution, at the Constitutional Convention, to put on the record that the principle, principles on which this republic is founded 
are incompatible with the continued existence of slavery. Not that we're going to end it tomorrow, not that we're going to force South Carolina to give up its slaves next year, but that the principle is clear. And if they had been able to do that, I think that history would have moved in a, in a different direction. You know, why it didn't happen is a series of ex- explanations that I'm not going to try to get into because I'm not even sure I can give them myself. But that this moment in 76 is an opportunity that Jefferson wants to have and it gets deleted. Turns out it's the best opportunity we were going to get. And you, as you said in our last conversation a couple of weeks ago, Joe, that there's an opportunity timeline. There's a window of opportunity. And that window is going to close. And when it closes, things are going to get much, much more difficult. And so I think I, I honor Jefferson for this. I know it was a disingenuous argument, and I know why the Congress did not accept that paragraph. But he was doing the right thing, and it was the only way that he could do it within the broader context of the complaint that was being made about tyranny and George the Third, And I think Jefferson was right to try. And if he had gotten away with it, it might have had some effect, as if, if Franklin had gotten away with his suggestion at the <laughs> convention, it might have had some effect. These things can be important. And so even though we all get it, that to blame George the Third for slavery would be like my saying, those Wright brothers are really horrible people because they gave us the internal combustion engine and now look at us. <laughs> well, I remember what, what, what Lincoln will say in the first line of the Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago, that is 1776, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. So that that becomes, that part becomes, uh, the, the, the paragraph that he wants to put in is deleted, but that's still there. And I'll also call attention to what are the three human rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The trinity that Locke has, John Locke, in Treatise on, um, what is it, Second Treatise on Government, is life, liberty, and property. Jefferson changes property to pursuit of happiness. That is a big deal. That is an implicit statement against slavery, because the slave owners are going to claim that one of their rights is the right to property. And it's a point of view that's going to be upheld in the Supreme Court decision later on in 1857. He is taking that away from them in the founding document. Joe, if Lincoln had been an Adamsite, which he wasn't, he would have said four score and seven years ago on the 2nd of July. <laughs> True, true. Adams thought, and I'll, we, we'll follow this up after a break, but Adams thought the big day, the real big day, was May 15th, <laughs> not even July 2nd. I'll explain that when I get a chance. Well, I, I have kind of a simple question. Before I go there, though, I, I think it's interesting that you both talk about Locke and Jefferson. Uh, you know, and I, I wonder sometimes in reading Locke, if some of Jefferson's anti-slavery feelings came from him. Uh, you know, Locke wrote, the natural liberty of man is to be free from any superior power on earth and not to be under the will or legislative authority of man, but to have only the law of nature for his rule. But back to my original question, is the fourth correct? I'm, I'm not getting a definitive answer here. I'm getting a lot of opinions. What So what do we think, Joe? Do we need to make July 2nd Adam's Day? We're never going to change it, right? Let's be realistic. It should have been the second. (laughs) And I go back to what we said at the start. Adams and Jefferson decided to make it right by dying on that day. From that point forward, it's the day. Yes. And and look, uh, is, is the 25th of December the day that Jesus was born? There is a there's a an arbitrariness to almost all human calendric activity, and so the Fourth of July gelled at the death, the simultaneous death of Jefferson and Adams, and there ain't no going back now. But we could at least have an asterisk. Mm-hmm. Uh, every orator on the Fourth of July before what the parade, the shows, the games, the sports, the guns, the bells, the bonfires, and the illuminations, every orator could say, 
you know, we should have done this two days ago, but here we are. So we're saying <laughs> an asterisk that, that that means Adams was right. Is that what you're saying? Careful. Uh, well, look, it depends on it depends on the lens you wear. You know, <laughs> what, what's, what, what's Adams talking about? He's saying that we stepped up. It took enormous moral courage. It was a chimerical and unlikely thing to accomplish, but we stepped up and declared legal revolutionary independence from Great Britain. That is the thing that needed to be commemorated. That's the pivotal moment in modern. And remember, history. there's a wonderful scene right after they voted on the second, when Benjamin Harrison uh, is talking with Elbridge Jerry. And Harrison is a heavy guy, and Jerry was a thin and lightweight guy. And Jerry said to Harrison, you're lucky, because when they catch us and they hang us, remember, they're risking their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor by, putting, by, by, putting, by voting the way they just voted. You're lucky because you're fat. And when they hang you, you're going to die quickly. Meanwhile, I will be twisting in the wind because I'm small and light for a long time. They really did think that the act of voting on the resolution on independence was their seminal commitment. That the 2nd of July is the pivotal moment. That's when the vote occurred in the Second Continental Congress to approve the resolution of independence. And the Declaration of Independence, I don't mean to sound uh, dismissive, but in some sense it's a news release. And that's why Adams is right about the second, but too late, too bad, case closed, because the 4th of July is one of the most deeply embedded moments uh, in our national consciousness. If you, if Congress proposed to change the date to May 15th or, or July 2nd, people would say, ah, not going to happen. Yeah. They changed the date for President's Hot Day. They can do that, but you don't, you don't mess with the 4th. Well, I, you know, you you brought up this this uh, story of uh, them, the signers, and and really what risk they put themselves in. You know, and by popular history today, people sort of gloss over that, um, but they really were putting their their lives at risk. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, like when a politician now says, "I'm taking a big risk. I'm running for office." <laughs> These guys, I mean, they knew. Uh, when Washington leaves Mount Vernon, he says to his um, his manager, Lund Washington, when the British come up the Potomac to burn Mount Vernon down, make sure you get my books out and also Martha. They were not necessarily, I think, in that order. That they, they presumed that they could, and you know, if in the Battle of Long Island, the, the American army hadn't been able to get back across the East River and they captured uh, the Washington and, and and annihilated most of the Continental Army. They would have taken Washington back to London. There would have been a show trial. He would have been hung. Then he'd have been quartered, and his head would be cut off and put on a spike so they all could see it for the next six months. That's what would have happened to him. They knew that. They knew that. And Jefferson among them. Uh, so, so you've got opportunity here. You mentioned that battle on Long Island without giving us the um, the Joe Ellis refrain, and oh yeah, I wrote a book about that. <laughs> I let you say you're my publicist right now, Clay. I don't know. I don't <laughs> like to be my own publicist. Uh, sure. Uh, so, but but here's where Jefferson and Adams agree. You know, we can we can quibble and squabble over second, fourth, whatever for the rest of time. Here's what they both agreed on. They both thought that however many setbacks there were, it was inevitable that we would win our independence. Jefferson believed that an island can't uh, control a continent, that the supply lines were simply too long and that we would just outlast the British. And Adams, I think, would say something like this, Joe, that we've been governing ourselves for a very long time. And so we know how to do this. And there's no way that they're going to be able to continue to do it because we have the habits of self-government that we have very deeply rooted now in American life. Right. I mean, they I've written a book about this. It's coming out in September. See? See? Yeah, it's called the the cause, and that the, the conventional thing to say is that it was a, you know a miracle that the Americans won the war. Because if you think about it, how many wars did Great Britain lose between 1750 and 
1950, one, um, ours, um, and they were the dominant m- m- military power, if you put the ground forces and the Navy together in the world. Um, so how could we possibly win? The real truth is the British never had a serious chance to win the war because they had to do more than win battles. They had to be able to subjugate the entire population. They stepped into, we as Americans can begin to understand the British dilemma in the American Revolutionary War much better after our own experience in Vietnam. A newly arrived world power with an omniscient sense of its significance and its power steps into a unwinnable and unnecessary war. Uh, That's exactly what the British did in 1775. The United States wins by not losing. Britain loses by not winning. (laughs) They have to win. They They have to occupy the, the, the new world for a very long time because all we have to do is outlast them. So a guerrilla war wins if you don't lose. All you have to do is outlast your occupier. Yeah, it's um, a key insight. The British and, had to win. All we had to do is not lose. Right, and so and Washington did not, that was not his natural bent. He wanted to win by winning. And it took him a number of months, even years, to realize, oh, that we're not going to win that way. We're never going to win that war, but we're going to win by not losing. It's time for us to take a short break, gentlemen. This week we're speaking via phone with Clay Jenkinson somewhere in the wilds of Dakota and Professor Joseph Ellis located in the Green Mountains of Vermont. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour, our weekly conversation this week with Clay Jenkinson and Professor Joseph Ellis about, is it the 2nd or the 4th of July? Joe, you wanted to respond to Clay's last comment. Go ahead. I agree with what he was saying about the the British dilemma. And Adams had, well, Adams was on record as saying the 2nd in his letters to Abigail. He actually writes two letters to her on that same day. He's so excited. But he also, in other correspondence, says, especially later when Jefferson is getting all this credit and the, the fourth is becoming the big day, and the declaration itself, the document, is so big. He develops the following explanation for why that's wrong. A resolution to be sent to all the colonies that they redo their colonial constitutions to become state constitutions and thereby act positively to declare their independence. That we don't need, he says, to declare our independence officially because George III has already declared his independence of us. And that if you agree to this right to and every, every colony and then every county and every town in New England, Virginia responded to this and committed itself to independence and to rewriting their constitutions. In fact, those documents were in front of Jefferson when he was writing the Declaration. And some of the language of the Declaration is pulled out of especially Virginia's uh, response to that request. So that the commitment is, is, there is a commitment on May 15th, and Adams says that's when the lightning strikes, and Jefferson's language is just the thunderous aftermath. Okay, but let's go back to the magic of Thomas Jefferson for a minute. I won't, I'm asking this as a rhetorical question. Uh, you know, one of the most memorable sentences that ever came out of the pen of John Adams. Jefferson has hundreds. Jefferson is the master word crafter of the early national period, fo- probably followed second by Thomas Paine. I've been reading um, Eric Larson's book, The Splendid and the Vile, about World War II during the Blitz. And, you know, Churchill, uh, in saying something like, never has in history has so much been owed by so many to so few mm-hmm. about the Battle of Britain, or we shall fight them in the fields, we shall fight them on the shore, we, and we will fight and we will win. When he marshaled that language, it changed the course of history. Language, when it is at its most magical, 
it is deeper than language. It has a it has a truly magical effect. And Jefferson had that quality. And Adams occasionally kind of brushes up against it. Washington doesn't have that quality. Payne has it in in a in a more common measure than Jefferson. Madison doesn't have it at all. It's not until Lincoln after Jefferson that there's another president who is a genius in the use of the English language. And Churchill had it. He probably saved the world with his capacity. If you watch the Gary Oldman film, someone says to Halifax after his great speech in Parliament, what just happened? And Halifax says, Churchill has taken the the English language into war. And that's exactly (laughs) what happened. And Jefferson had it. And so we can never... Okay, let's just say that that it is the 2nd of July or May 15th. You cannot think about American history without the Declaration of Independence. Martin Luther King couldn't figure out how to convince us to do the right thing without invoking the Declaration. Lincoln couldn't determine how to negotiate our way through the the greatest civil uh, unrest in our history without going back to that document. And Jefferson would be the first person to say, hey, it's not particularly original. I was It was really stuff that was in the air. I just put my own verbal cadence on it. But the fact is, Jefferson was the magic man. I don't, I don't even think that even the most anti-Jeffersonian person can refute that. Uh, don't you agree, Joe? I do agree. I do agree. Words do make a difference. I, I mean, I think as a reader of all of, of the Jefferson papers and the Adams papers, there's a difference in their styles and in their language, Jefferson's language elevates, it levitates above evidence and facts. Adams is is buried in the facts and is buried in emotional forces at at play. Um, His diaries, diaries, Jefferson doesn't have a diary, his diaries are really wonderful. They're more revealing. I don't disagree at all about the, the public influence of Jefferson's language. And Jefferson's language is inclusive to me. I mean, that's that's a big part of it is Locke wrote all mankind being all equal and independent. Jefferson wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Jefferson's language is uh, the book I wrote about Jefferson is called American Sphinx. And the title refers to the fact that people can look at Jefferson and his language and discover multiple meanings, some of which Jefferson intends, some of which he doesn't. But he has the ability, he's like the dirigible above the Super Bowl, flashing inspirational messages to both sides on, of the of the uh, stadium. And um, he's got that ability. And, and, uh, we needed it. I mean, Clay's right. Everything he said earlier is correct in that regard. Um, but it also means that he's a kind of everyman. Um, you know, uh, Herbert Hoover thought he, Jefferson was, was on his side during the Depression. So did FDR. Uh, Clarence Darrow uh, thought he was on his side in the, uh, the Scopes trial. And um, and William Jennings Bryan thought, thought the other. Um uh, Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton thought, thought they were Jeffersonians, so that there's this elusive quality to Jefferson's language and his mentality that serves him well. Um, uh, but it's um, well, I'll I'll stop there. I repeat what I always say every year: you need a dreamer at the center of your national enterprise. You must have a dreamer. Jefferson's dreams. There's a, as you know, Joe. Beneath the, the glorious surface of Jefferson's dreams, there's a subterranean world of greater complexity and tension and sometimes even darkness. That That's the problem with Jefferson. He annoys us and perplexes us and inspires us and enrages us and yet winds up still inspiring us. And he, he's unique in this capacity. And that's why people around him, including Adams, found it a little bit hard to trust Jefferson completely because they they were able to see and measure the gap Mm -hmm. and and that made them think is this guy really authentic because he's not quite that person he projects and frankly we aren't that people he projects and 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 furthermore we're not going to be small family farmers so get over it Jefferson Mm -hmm. and yet even when you want to dismiss Jefferson even when you know better you can't help but being swept up in the Jefferson music. It's it's absolutely a marvelous thing. So I want to ask each of you this question, starting with Joe. 
How will you spend the 4th of July? Hmm. Um, or, or let's just say, how will you spend the 2nd of July? <laughs> I'll spend the 2nd of July not aware that it's the 2nd in that <laughs> sense, because I'm converted to the 4th. Um, uh, if my kids were younger, I would be taking them to the public uh, exhibit in uh, Amherst of fireworks, but they're they're too they're not going to be there. And um, um, I think if I really do what I want to do, I'm going to go fly fishing. Fly fishing? On, what will you eat? Will there be fireworks? Will you have a hot dog? Will you have a beer? Will you? Um, Ellen takes care of that kind of stuff, and she'll probably serve us something. Uh, uh, like um, uh, uh, barbecue and coleslaw um, and uh, beer or or a soda. At 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time, that's the death hour for John Adams on the 4th of July, 1826. I will raise a glass of something. I hope it's sherry, uh, not Ham's beer, to you. David Spenson, how will you spend the 4th of July? Well, you know me. I'm pretty low-key about these holidays, but I do something personal to note the note the, the, the celebration. And, you know, in my long tenure as semi-permanent temper, how is it, guest host? Um, you know, <laughs> I, I've... Uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've come to recognize um, the importance of the day um, in, a, in a whole new and much deeper way. I probably look at it a little more politically, emotionally than, than I used to. But I'm not one for big public celebrations, although who knows what shall happen. Barbecue and fly fishing sounds pretty darn good to me. <laughs> well, I, I, I want to counter my fly fishing thing with this thought that on this 4th, there's a special need for us as Americans to celebrate the same event together. Ah, and to be able to uh, respect and, uh, and honor a set of values that are present at the start of the American founding and, and that make us distinctive as a nation and as a people. And I don't know that it's been quite some time when the divisiveness is deeper than it is now. And if anything can help us to, at least temporarily, come together as a single people, I'm all in favor of it. I do also think that this 4th of July has special meaning in America because, in the world, but especially, of course, here, because we have survived the pandemic. Uh, it's not over yet, but the worst of it is over. It took about 18 months um, and um, certainly 15 months, and it, it came very close to, to prostrating uh, this country and the world, and a lot of people's lives have been changed, some shattered uh, mm -hmm. by experience. It's been an ordeal. It's been one of the great social ordeals of the uh, the 21st century, and I think that people are going to be in a mood to get outside in the sun mm -hmm. and to be with neighbors and friends and family and to uh, imbibe their favorite beverage and to eat a hot dog or a, a cheeseburger and to watch fireworks and to celebrate a kind of a liberation from this thing. I mean, I, I, I would be hard pressed to think of another thing in my lifetime that has had such a complete uh, distorting effect on the social life of the nation and the world as the pandemic uh, has done. And so I think that people are in a mood to, to declare their independence of this disease. Well said. Clay was eloquent there and uh, Jeffersonian eloquent. And um, uh, if you look at figures in American history that are capable of speaking to us collectively as a people, um, I, I, Jefferson's got to be in that group and near the top of the list. And so let's, you know, all, I mean, we, all of us need to just say it. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And maybe say we are all Federalists, we are all Republicans, too. 
that's in his first <laughs> inaugural, yes. But that'll, that's a little harder to swallow at this moment oh, in America. <laughs> but I, well, that's, I want, a, that's a reason to use it, though. <laughs> I, I say thank God we're Americans. You know, uh, for all that's wrong with America, the idea of America is still the most breathtaking idea of the Enlightenment. And uh, my only hope is that we will somehow recover and move back towards Enlightenment values and somehow either maintain what's left of our republic or reinvigorate it in some way. But I think that, that it, the idea of America is, in the history of the world, is one of the most potent ideas ever. And its potency doesn't even collapse when we're at our worst, as we sometimes are. And we have it so good. You know, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, Clay, about, you know, people in the grievance culture, as you put it. But as Joe was talking earlier, you know, the, the men who signed the Declaration of Independence, they knew what was in store for them. And so I guess that's one of the things I reflect on, too, is how many of us would risk that for our freedom? And it's one thing to um, get online anonymously and complain about it or or shout in crowds about it. But those men, those men and women, those citizens, um, they risked everything so that we could have what we have now. So let me ask you an exit question on this special edition of the Thomas Jefferson, or this 4th of July, this, this 2nd or 4th of July edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. When Adams, at the age of 91, on his deathbed up there in Quincy, Massachusetts, the Duke of Braintree, uh, was uh, dying on the 4th of July, 1826, and his last words, let's say we agree, were Thomas Jefferson still survives or Thomas Jefferson still lives. Uh, this, is a, this is a multiple choice question. Is the tone of those words was, A, um, I love Jefferson, and uh, it's, it's, in some way it's appropriate that he continues to uh, embody America. B, uh, you know, that, darn that Jefferson, you know, now he's outlasted me too. Or C, it's just a fact of both men knowing that they're dying. I think it's a little of one and two that there was a running joke among them throughout the correspondence they have between 1812 and 1826, uh, 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 or that which of them is going to be last of this of the signers of the Declaration of Independence to live, to you know, to pass. And Adams had a running joke. He said, "Whoever's last is like the person who has to." shovel the ashes back into the fireplace before he goes to bed. And, um, and it could be you or it could be me. And it, it turns out to be neither one of them. It, it, it's Charles Carroll of Carrollton in Maryland who outlasts him. But that there is this, they had that running joke, but I think that I'd like to believe that it's one friend who now sees in his other friend, uh, a man who was the other half of the American Revolution, that, that, that they are together collectively a whole revolution, but each one of them represents a different strain of it and a different interpretation of its full meaning, and that Jefferson's meaning still lives. You could take it to mean that he knows that Jefferson's reputation is going to outlast his, that there will be a memorial on the tidal basin to Jefferson, but nothing to him, and that he accepts it, embraces it. Um, uh, but we're speculating. I'm speculating. Gentlemen, we need to bring this conversation to a close. Uh, it's been marvelous to listen to the two of you. And Clay, I'll give you the last word. Any thoughts for our, our listeners? I know both of you would join me in wishing everyone a happy Independence Day. I can think of no better way to end this special edition of the Jefferson Hour than to hear Joe Ellis talk in the way that he did about those last minutes of John Adams' life, and so generously, too. I wish everybody a happy Independence Day, whatever day you choose to uh, commemorate it. And uh, let us all remember that Jefferson was right Liberty is something that we can never take for granted. We'll see you next week for another important edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour.
The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson.